It's time for this week's Prairie Cast. This week's Prairie Cast is brought to you by Delta Dental of Iowa, who reminds you that you don't have to work for a big company to get big benefits. Delta Dental offers a dental plan to fit your needs. Whether it is a single policy, one for your family, or one for the team at your startup, visit DeltaDentalIA.com to learn more about your many plan options. Hi there, and welcome to episode 72 of PrairieCast for January 31st, 2012. I'm Jeff Wood of Silicon Prairie News, and our panel today includes Marco Santana of the Des Moines Register, in studio along with myself and co-host Andy Broodkla of 48 Web. Joining us online uh, via Skype is Michael Stacy from Omaha. Marco, uh, how are you today? <laughs> I'm doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me. Pretty excited to do this. First time guest on PrayCast. Yeah, yeah. uh, try to go easy on you as we, we typically <laughs> I, do. Trust me, I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, you've only been in Des Moines a few months, but how are you liking uh, joining the Silicon Prairie I'll, community? You know, it's it's been great. I mean, and, and that's such a PR line to say, but you know what? It, it has <laughs> been fun, and there's a lot of energy and a lot of buzz, and it's been fun to kind of get, get involved with it, yeah. And this is typically what Januarys are, 30, you know, 60 degrees at the end of January. That's, <laughs> That's typically the way we kind of roll here. So, uh, Michael, how about you? How are things in Omaha today? Uh, they're good. Also warm here. A little disappointed that we couldn't do like an outdoor broadcast of PrairieCast, but uh, I'm doing well. Thanks. Good. That's a good idea as we move forward. Uh, we do outdoor broadcast for sure. Yeah. Uh, today has been a, a busy day. I just got back from a presentation, the Above the Line presentation. Uh, the Iowa Startup Fair is right after this, so we're going to kind of jam things in real quick for PrairieCast today and, and move along. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. First story we have, uh, topic one, is Pipeline's Innovator of the Year, which took place just last week. For those that don't know, Pipeline is the Kansas City-based uh, Technology Entrepreneur Immersion Program. Um, like I said, they announced the 2012 Innovator of the Year in an event in Overland Park late last week. Michael was there. We're going to talk to him about that. The program originally launched in 2007 by the Kansas Technology Enterprise Corporation, which I think is now defunct, but it was kind of like TAI, maybe. Mm-hmm. Technology Association of Iowa here uh, started this program and recognizing 10 different entrepreneurs, taking them through a process all year long and then kind of kicking off or ending each year um, with this event. They received funding from the Kauffman Foundation this past year to move the program outside of Kansas and have brought it to Missouri and Nebraska. And this first this class that was announced at the event is the first time they've had people from those states and uh, they moved to 12. So let's just kind of jump in and talk about it from there. Michael, probably best to start with you as you were um, live on, on the ground reporting for us. Uh, what was it like? Uh, it was a great event and kind of uh, hard to probably distill everything that happened over the, over the course of that day into you know one podcast. But I think it's kind of important to take us back to the start of, of our coverage of Pipeline, which was in April when they announced that $800,000 grant from the Kauffman Foundation, which was a matching challenge grant. Uh, which meant that as Pipeline expanded from specifically Kansas to the rest of the region, that they had to find you know local supporters and, and funding from across the region to continue the program. Uh, and so you know it, it was kind of a evolving process. And Joni Cobb, the the CEO and president of Pipeline, kept us posted on the developments and the progress. And so to see that $800,000 challenge grant uh, kind of come to fruition in the form of the announcement of the first regional class this weekend was uh, was an interesting process. And definitely the the new regional field was reflected in the makeup of the first class. Uh, a dozen entrepreneurs uh, divided between Kansas, Nebraska, and Missouri, and I think roughly a third from each of those states. So uh, definitely be interesting to see kind of the future direction of the program. But uh, Having having charted it from the the launch of that challenge grant until this weekend was uh, kind of a fun journey to view. Yeah, I, I would I would agree um, as well. Watch it looks like you know you go to various events those types of things and it looks like from the pictures that you took and the different things that we've shared that this was a, a first class event and uh, for one I'm disappointed that Iowans are not eligible for this and Michael have you ever uncovered why that is like why they chose the states they did? Uh, I think having kind of watch the progression that it, it has to do with local support and uh, that's not to say that there isn't support for entrepreneurship in Iowa because there clearly is but in Missouri and in Nebraska uh, Pipeline was able to find kind of local champions for the cause in Missouri uh, one notable one is Grassmere Partners uh, founded by Pete Brown and then in Nebraska uh, a combination of folks including Jim and Karen Linder 
uh, and some other folks really kind of championed the cause locally and were able to, to uh, drum up some financial support for the program. I uh, don't know if, if they were less successful in Iowa or whether the geographic footprint was just too large. But uh, for whatever reason, Nebraska and Missouri made the most sense for uh, at least the initial expansion of the program. Yeah, it, it, I would think that, that you're right. I don't know that they ever tried Iowa. Um, I don't know if they're looking to go west or south either as they, what their region is as compared to the, the Silicon Prairie that, that we talk about. But um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the companies that um, – Let's talk about the 2010 company or 2011 companies. Who was the innovator of the year? And it starts with um, Kyle Johnson of Audio Anywhere. I know that we've been aware of Audio Anywhere for a while, but we haven't really written about this company yet. Um, did you guys? Did you check out Audio Anywhere? Have you had a chance to look I at their I had software? A to look at it now. Um, Michael, you, you wrote some good things about it. I'm just going to read what you wrote here. Um, Audio Anywhere is out to save the music industry, a web-based social streaming music service that's designed to work in tandem with an ad platform also produced by audio, the Audio Anywhere team, to monetize online music, uh, using low-cost target advertising to help make a small profit on every song they play. Uh, what was so compelling about this? Because they pitched, right? All 10 innovators pitched, and then they were chosen as, as Innovator of the Year. What was compelling about this one as compared to the others? Uh, well, it's important to note that the, the Innovator of the Year not, was not based solely upon the pitch session, although that was about a third of the overall consideration. There was, there was other stuff as far as kind of what they had done throughout uh, the course of the pipeline year. Uh, but first and foremost, the, the passion of Kyle Johnson when he pitched, uh, one of the highlights of the pitch session was when some of the judges, I believe it was Lars Perkins, the, uh, the founder of Picasa, kind of challenged Kyle with a question about uh, I, forget, I forget what the specific question was, but Kyle kind of challenged him right back and said, I want to hear you. How would you answer that question? So he's definitely a passionate founder. Uh, it's no small ambition to save the music industry, but Kyle believes that uh, the ad the ad back platform that they have is going to be the key to that. Uh, you've got services like Spotify and like Pandora that uh, according to you know the Audio Anywhere estimates are losing money. By contrast, uh, Audio Anywhere is based on the ad uh, revenue that it can draw. So it's it's a front of streaming music, but but underneath it is a business model that, that Kyle Johnson believes is sustainable. And apparently the uh, the judges and those responsible for Innovator of the Year also see some uh, validity in that model. I'm wondering if the, the judges answered back uh, correctly. Did they, did they get back to him at all? Did, yeah, was their answer, did it suffice for Kyle? Uh, it mostly brought a lot of chuckles from the room <laughs> because uh, I think I think the expectation was that Kyle would kind of you know tuck his tail and walk away, but he got you know right back in the judges' faces, and uh, that was kind of another interesting dynamic of the whole thing. Is that uh, I actually had the chance to talk to Kyle the day after for a story that uh, that will run on Silicon Prairie News in the near future, so stay tuned. But uh, great teaser, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. A little self promotion. Uh, Kyle said that. Uh, Usually, when you pitch to you know VCs and investors, that either uh, they'll be interested and maybe less prone to kind of picking your idea apart, or they just won't give you the time of day because they're not interested. So this kind of contentious, challenging nature of uh, the pitch session was definitely an interesting aspect of uh, the proceedings. What well, what were the metrics for judging? Was it just based on the presentation, or were there demos of any products, or how did they judge it? Uh, it was based in part on presentation. They also had, you know, their their business models and projected financials and that sort of thing. Uh, and some of the statistics that they shared were kind of for, you know, judges and and the attendees' eyes only. But there was there was plenty of data that the judges were going off of. And uh, you know, there it was a 30, 30 minute rather pitch, about fifteen minutes of the pitch, and then fifteen minutes of Q and A. So it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't just some shallow analysis. They definitely kind of dug in and uh, and gave it a thorough look over. Yeah, very very cool. Um, I think the the whole piece is interesting. I guess with what happened with Innovator of the Year. Um, just I'm still thinking a little bit about Kyle challenging um, that judge uh, and just thinking I've never had the chance to raise money. I've never been in a company where I was necessarily going to do that. But especially when you're in those rooms, I think that you're right. When you have the um, uh, when you're getting challenged like that, you know they're at least interested because we talk a lot here about the, the Midwest maybe, like people will tacitly agree with what you're doing but they don't really care and mm -hmm. kind of move along. So um, I think that's interesting. I did have a chance one time to give a presentation in front of Brad Feld 
um, was not for investment, but I think he views everything like an investor, and that's exactly what he did to me. It was like kind of challenged me, I think on Des Moines, I think was what the question was. <laughs> questions about Des Moines and what was going on here, and I was like, oh, this must be what it's like to pitch Brad Feld for investments. Well, so. I think that that's one of the, the big things when you're pitching them. I mean, the, these people are very passionate about what they do, and they know what they do, and, but then you have other people who've been through that, and they want to make sure that these guys are ready for, for the next step. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any, any other highlights? Uh, we can talk a little bit about the, the class moving forward, but any other highlights on the event or uh, the folks that were in the 2011 class? Uh, I suppose one thing is just kind of the diversity of ideas on display. Uh, it, was, it was funny, after uh, Kyle presented, which, you know, a live uh, music streaming platform, he was followed by uh, a service that aggregates angel tax credits. And so the, the guy who followed him kind of made a joke that, Hey, my service might not be quite as sexy as Kyle's, but uh, it's it's worthwhile nonetheless. And there was just uh, just a diversity of ideas on display from those two to one company uh, that made equipment that uh, monitored the liquid levels on industrial sized tanks to a mobile app developer. So just kind of a, a wide variety of ideas contained within just the borders of Kansas. Yeah, we take a. Typically at Silicon Prairie News, we take a kind of a, a just one chunk of the industry and say like these consumer focused kind of tech startups are what we tend to report on the most. Um, but but Pipeline is one of those events that stretches beyond that. I think your reporting stretches beyond that too. You're, mm -hmm. you're looking at wider entrepreneurial issues, not just tech startups. Yeah, absolutely. I think that I think it's uh, you know that's the bigger bigger picture thing of, of trying to make sure that we get that picture, we get the the big scene of the whole um, everything that's going on, instead of just trying to you know it, we do one thing well, but you got to make sure you cover the other, th other things as well. So yeah, and, and as a more general interest publication mm -hmm. than, than ours, which is pretty industry focused, right, I right. think that you have the opportunity to do that. Um, Kyle Johnson is in the chat room, and he says uh, to check out the book Pitch Anything. So um, there might be some good resources there. He's not the first one I've heard that from, too. Really? So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So everybody yeah. check out Pitch Anything. I've not read that. Um, I, uh, but Kyle, congratulations on becoming Innovator of the Year, and thanks for joining us on PrairieCast uh, today. Michael, the 2012 class, um, moving forward, 12 people, as you said, they're kind of split by state. I, I did read some comments from Joni that it wasn't – intended to be that way like they didn't have a mandate that each state was represented a third but i'm sure there was some desire for that um but we have lincoln we have omaha lots of kansas city looks like uh st louis and then wichita um anybody that sticks out to you on this list uh, i mean a few are, are folks that i'm familiar with primarily from around here in the omaha lincoln area and haven't had much of a chance to to delve too deeply into kind of the, the businesses and the ideas of of the entire class, but one thing that does strike me is the geographic diversity, which as you mentioned, Joni said that there were no quotas, this is just kind of the way that things shook out, uh, but it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, the, the challenges, I guess, associated with these modules, you know, having to, having to bring people from a little bit further away, but I think it also just increases the caliber of uh, the ideas and the diversity of ideas, which was a big part of, of the 2011 class by having you know, folks from a wider geographic area. So are they driving to Kansas City for meetings or are these kind of online events for the pipeline immersion process? Uh, as I understand it, once per quarter they get together in a different location and I think there will be like a Nebraska module. People joke that maybe it would have to be around a, uh, a football Saturday, but uh, there will be modules held in, in various cities throughout the region uh, and I believe that's four times a year. Okay. Did the people who joked about that, was that heard at social media? <laughs> no, no, I don't know if it was Blake Lawrence, although Blake obviously uh, being a former Husker would be, uh, would be interested in that sort of thing. I, th looking at the class for 2012, what interested me most are the companies that I recognized and I didn't get a chance to go through them all, um, but three social media kind of related technology companies, which was a little surprising to me. Um, that kind of for tech, that was the direction they went. Not that they're bad companies, but that they have three that way. And looking at Infogy, which is tools for social media, um, social assurance is kind of brand awareness, isn't it? Do you, know, you probably know more about uh, Ben's company. Uh, it is, and I think it's kind of protecting the brand, and, and we'll learn a little bit more tonight. They actually, uh, Ben and, and Matt Sikoski, the founders of Social Assurance, are speaking at Corn Stocks this evening. Oh, okay. So yet another promo, we'll have more on that in the coming days. But there is, there is a lot of social media. Another thing that struck me is that this class kind of trends younger than what I understand previous classes have. I uh, don't know if that was just kind of the, the way things shook out or if that was by design, but uh, 
you know, between Blake and, and uh, Infogy and Justin Graves at Infogy and, and some of those others, uh, it's a fairly young class from what I can tell. Yeah, it would be interesting to follow them throughout the year and see what uh, how those companies progress and, and into the future. Also, Sky Skyvu, Skyview, Skyvu Technologies, the makers of the Battle Bears series um, of iPhone games, and uh, which we've covered before. Um, ben is in that class as well. So, congratulations to the 2012 class. Um, I do also want to give a word of thanks to our sponsor for today's show, Delta Dental of Iowa. Uh, when it comes to taking care of your smile, rely on a company you can trust. Fact is, more Iowans trust their smiles to Delta Dental. Whether you're looking for a dental policy for you, your company, your startup, your family, visit deltadentalia.com to learn more about your many plan options. Thanks again uh, for supporting Silicon Prairie News and entrepreneurs in Iowa. Did we get the smile cam? No. <laughs> no. Uh, I was at the, the Iowa State basketball game this weekend, and they had the smile cam. And I was like, we need to get that for PrairieCast. Um, as long as I don't have a kiss cam. No kiss cam. <laughs> no. Not, not, not with the guests we have on this show. Um, no, very good. So thanks again, Delta Dental. Uh, want to move on to uh, the second week of our new popular segment, the Fast Four. Uh, for those that don't remember from last week, here's how it works. We're going to cover four topics very fast. I will introduce each topic, end with a question, and give each of the panelists a chance to answer I will consider what the three of you say, and uh, then I will on who is right. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, the first one is Adam Bells of the Des Moines Register, one of your colleagues. This week at Shazam, which is the network of banks and financial institutions and, and folks that I know are at Iowa, most famous be from having their logo on the ATMs mm -hmm. that you see them. But Shazam is going to launch a mobile card option. Uh, it'll be a slide reader, kind of similar to Square. It will cost as little as $40, and it'll be... Um, uh, intended for people on the move, taxis, things like that. That was reported this, this week. So the question is, will Shazam's new mobile card reader, priced as low as $40, be able to compete with Square, which is already on the market and free? Marco, you can have the others. I, I think yes, but it depends on how they follow up. It's one thing to jump in the market. It's a completely different thing to adapt with it. So we'll see how they follow up on this announcement. All right, Michael, your thoughts? Uh, let me first and foremost say that I'm excited by the name Fast Four. It calls to mind a Vin Diesel movie, so congratulations <laughs> on the new segment. But uh, I, I say no uh, in, in competing with Square. Uh, Square beat them to market. Uh, there's less of a barrier to entry in terms of the money that the users have to pay, and I never want to bet against Jack Dorsey, so uh, they, Shazam faces an uphill battle if it hopes to knock off Square. Andy. I say no. Uh, you gotta bring that dongle down to free, and you gotta beat Square on rates. If if you can beat Square on rates, maybe you get the people to pay for the dongle, but I don't think they're going to be able to. I will rule on this one, no as well. I don't think you can beat free. I think what Shazam has going for him is the network that they already have, and I think that's what they have to be banking on. Right. But I don't know why you don't just build your technology and utilize the device that's already there. That's the big question, and and, and we'll see. All right, question number two. Zarley has changed up their Kansas City workforce. Allison Raylitz of the Kansas City Business Journal wrote that not only did they reduce the staff in their Kansas City office, but they have added staff to their East and West Coast office. The question is, does this make Zarley any less of a Silicon Prairie company? Uh, yes or no, Andy? No. <clears throat> no, they are not less? No, wait, I yes. Didn't phrase that question right. <laughs> no, they are not as much of a Silicon Prairie company. I've never really thought of them as much of a Silicon Prairie company. Um, aside from those location, but we talked a couple weeks ago about CEOs um, telecommuting, and we never say that Smarty Pig was based in Austin when they had a CEO in Austin, so no. No. Michael? Uh, I say this particular move does not make it less of a Silicon Prairie company. I think there were moves prior to this that kind of did that. Uh, at the same time, the the power of the CEO in a city shouldn't be underestimated, and I think Kansas City still has the third largest team of Zarley employees, so it, it's kind of maintaining its Silicon Prairie-ness. Silicon Prairie-ness. Like <laughs> yeah. Marco. I think, yes, it, it is less of a Silicon Prairie startup because, I mean, just by the nature of the moves. I mean, you're taking away workforce from here and put them on the scholar side. I mean, something to be said for the CEO's base, but you know, ultimately, if the numbers are moving to the coasts. I, I would agree. This does make them less of a Silicon Prairie company. Uh, it's a, um, I've always been a little disappointed that they haven't embraced the community as much as they have. Uh, Allison did say that they have plans to have more hires in Kansas City. So let's see if that shakes out. And we would love to see that. We, we appreciate Zerly. We like what they're doing. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, when they launched, I had high hopes that they were going to be um, as committed as some of the other companies that we report on and, and really haven't seen that from them. So um, we'll see where that goes. 
No, where that goes. Third question. Kansas City startup LiveOn.com sponsored Justin Wilson's car in the Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona race this past weekend. That's a 24-hour sports car race. Uh, and that car won. The question is, does having a Silicon Prairie startup on your car now ensure that you'll win in motorsports? And if so, will we see more startups represented in places like the Iowa Speedway this season and the Kansas Motor Speedway throughout 2012? Uh, Michael, you can start this one. I think we'll know there's something to this if uh, the Patriots or the Giants take the field this weekend with Live On logos on their jerseys. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if this is a trend we're going to see. I think startups, a lot of them are more interested in dedicating their resources to growth rather than this type of marketing. So I don't, I don't see a lot of it happening. Andy? Nope, too expensive. Too expensive? Yep. Even if it ensures you'll win? It's a lot of money to throw out an advertising campaign. Fair. Well, I'll be excited when it's Startup City 300 at the Wallace Speedway <laughs> sponsored by Shazam. That, that's what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Yes, I, I, I don't think that we'll see a lot of startups do this, but this is a personal like bucket list item of mine is to have a company that I'm working with represented on an indie car and get to like have that whole experience of you know uh, sitting at the 500 things like that. Get um, your face on a race car. Get, get my face. Yeah, I go. don't know about that. But, uh, <laughs> but congratulations to LiveOn.com um, and for what they chose to do and, and the fact that Justin Wilson's car uh, one that's I think that's just great. See, fast forward allows us to do things like this. We can't necessarily write a whole story about that, but we can we can have some fun talking about the story. And congratulations <laughs> to them on the win. <clears throat> yeah, uh, producer John is reminding us uh, that there was once a thing called the Ruan Grand Prix. So there was an entire race based on one of Des Moines' most famous entrepreneurs, and it is no longer and hasn't been for. 15, 20 years? Yeah. That was uh, so cool, though. I don't know why they don't do that. I would love to see a Grand Prix <laughs> through the streets of Des Moines again. That would be awesome. Uh, okay, fourth, fast forward, number four. Des Moines Register reported yesterday on a proposed $100 million seed fund being championed by the Iowa Innovation Council, the Iowa Department of Economic, no, Iowa Development, I did, uh, <laughs> and the governor's office. The reporter, Donnell Eller, said sparking startups is seen as key to Governor Terry Branstad's pledge to add 200,000 jobs in Iowa and boost family incomes 25% over five years. Question, uh, Marco, we'll start with you. Will startups account for 200,000 new jobs in Iowa in five years? That's a high bar. That's a high bar to set. I think, uh, you know, the pieces are in place for it to contribute greatly to those 200,000 jobs, but I don't know if they all come from startups. That's it. Yes, Michael, I can't weigh in yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I agree that's a high bar. Uh, just looking at the, the data from the last year, I think it was about 1.5 million jobs total, so that's a huge chunk of them. Uh, again, I, I say no. That's no. I'd be happy if they created like 1,000 or 5,000 new jobs, but 200,000 is way, way too much of a uh, goal. Yeah, I, and I think you're right. I think that no, 200,000 jobs will not come from startups in, in Iowa in the next five years. <clears throat> but I hope that a significant uh, amount do. I, I think those numbers are always fuzzy when people try to claim what's a new job and what's not. But I love that the state has attention focused on this, and I think that's the, the real lesson here. Um, as for the fund, I mean, it was cool that the, the register had the, I mean, it was the above the fold top article yesterday was on this seed fund. I don't know a whole lot about the Iowa Innovation Council and what they're doing. Um, be interesting to see how this kind of rolls out. There were some, some Kauffman Foundation quotes in there um, as well about these programs not necessarily doing what they're designed to do. So check that story out in the register. I think it's sure. important to note that the attention's there, and I think that's that's what's helping you know, help this out. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a great point. Yeah. Okay, that was the fast four, but bonus question before you go away. Um, and this came about two hours ago that this was suggested, so we're going to throw it in here. Chris Snyder's social media strategies class at Drake is attempting to win Des Moines' its very own Foursquare badge. Several cities internationally have these. They're very sought after, and Foursquare has created this opportunity for cities to three cities to win their own that wouldn't necessarily get them. Um, and Chris's class picked up the, uh, I guess, the mantle here to, to be able to do it. Judging will be based on quality of list, the list of places um, in the city to visit, as well as how many followers the list gets and how many people mention it on Twitter. Question for Marco, will they be successful? A lot of competition, but I'm going to root for the home team and say yes, we will get it. <laughs> Michael? Uh, I'm going to represent the other uh, Silicon Prairie interest, Omaha and Kansas City, and say they should throw their uh, name in the ring. But uh, I don't know. It's an uphill battle. Fair enough. You can never keep Des Moines down. <laughs> Do more Des Moines. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I'm hearing a yes there. I think the, the answer is yes. I think Chris Snyder's class will do this. A lot of these things, when there is a concentrated effort behind them, um, uh, really are what make them happen. Plus, Foursquare owes us. For those of you that don't know, I sent them a Des Moines care package back in December of 2009, asking them to add Des Moines to the list when they were going city by city. They had Omaha, they didn't have Des Moines, so I put things in there like 
Ray Gun t-shirts, uh, Baby Boomer cookies, which was the president's favorite cookie when he was here um, in the last campaign, and CDs from the NADA and got zero response from them. So uh, I think they owe us, if Dennis Crowley's watching us, I'm sure he does yes, every week. Of course. Uh, we would like to see Des Moines added for sure. If you want to learn more about my little project, go to bit.ly uh, slash Foursquare 4SQ DSM package um, to see that. If you want to, which is more important than that, and you want to actually mm -hmm. contribute to Des Moines getting uh, the badge, go to 4SQ.com slash DSM Foursquare. Andy will put that in the chat room, we'll put it in the post, but that is where Chris's class is actually um, putting this list together. Um, and then you visit the places on the list. I think they had 31 sites the last time I was there. I had done 18 of them. Um, <laughs> so I have some work to do, um, as well as being a good Long weekend. Yeah, it's yeah. good, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so that was the fast four. Did you guys enjoy that? Oh yeah. Yeah, fast five. Fast five, it was fast, fast four plus bonus. <laughs> that, the and one of the fast four. Um, very good. Let's go ahead and move on to the next topic, and that is the Gigabit Challenge, another big KC story. Um, the Kansas City's Gigabit Challenge is now complete. I think we've talked about it a little bit before, um, but we had a great guest post this week uh, from Chris Bernard of Microsoft BizSpark, and this is a new series that they've sponsored with us called Sparking Innovation. Chris was one of the judges at the Gigabit Challenge, so he reflected on what he thought this meant to the Silicon Prairie to have that. He's a Silicon Prairie guy. I mean, he's from Ames originally, went to school at the University of Iowa, and now he lives in Chicago and works startups for Microsoft. Um, so it's really interesting. It was great to welcome Bismarck um, to this series, but, but looking at the Gigabit Challenge for sure, I, I just wanted to revisit that. Um, so Gigabit Challenge was a contest put on by Think Big Partners in Kansas City uh, with the goal of highlighting unique applications that are enabled by the planned Google Fiber infrastructure that's coming there. Uh, it attracted interest from around the world, had judges and advisors from around the world, and the winner was I'm going to call him Scene. Do you know if I'm right, Michael? Uh, I'm not. I, I want to say Sign. But... Sign. S E I N uh, as an acronym. Uh, New York based web. New York based web cloud computing company uh, for the analysis and portfolio management of structured financial securities. So very complicated things. A little bit above my head what they do, but I want to talk about it. They received a hundred thousand dollar prize package uh, that included consulting's uh, cash benefit of twenty thousand dollars and. Um, yeah, that was kind of the prize package for that. So that was recently. Michael, you covered this story for us. So let, kind of take it away and tell us your thoughts on the Gigabit Challenge. Uh, unfortunately, I was not on the ground in Kansas City for that. So I'm relying on the, the live stream and such. But uh, yeah, Sign took took first place. Uh, Perusia Technologies, which is a Kansas City-based company, won kind of the audience vote. Uh, a little bit of a hometown favorite there. And then uh, Kazoo, which is based in Chicago, uh, took a... a Born Global Prize, which is a two hundred fifty thousand dollar convertible note from Gramercy Private Equity. Uh, I think what stood out about Sign is that you know, with the data that they need to process and just kind of the nature of the business, they may have illustrated better than others the need for that uh, that bandwidth that Google Fiber enables. So I think uh, whereas some of these other businesses had good ideas and maybe good business models. Sign really uh, emphasized and, and was able to illustrate its need for that high speed network. And the big question to this is now that they've won the money and they're, they have this great idea that the judges thought had validity enough to give them top prize, are they going to build this in Kansas City and take advantage of Google Fiber? Uh, and that, that remains to be seen. I need to look into that. Another thing that, that is interesting to me is that this is Google Fiber uh, and the kind of the tagline the whole time has been fiber in every home. Uh, it is being routed to neighborhoods and to homes before businesses. So there are a lot of logistical things I think that still need to be ironed out. But uh, I know that there are people within the community hoping that they can get special coding and special permissions to route uh, this fiber to a handful of kind of business centers as well. That's really interesting. That's the first time I've heard that. Maybe I've just missed it, that it was coming to neighborhoods and homes before businesses. Is that publicly being talked about? Uh, yeah, and it's it's been kind of, uh, I don't know, I guess de-emphasized, but uh, in the excitement over it and the, the vision for various business ideas, uh, Google has kind of quietly emphasized that it's fiber in every home, and I, th I think that's the tagline. But uh, yeah, there are various neighborhoods and such trying to jump on board as well, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, which part of town Google picks to uh, deliver this to first. That's a big part of several unknowns in this equation. Do we know? Uh, this might be an unknown, but do we know what the limits are? Are they the actual cities of Kansas City, Kansas, and Missouri? I've asked this question 
several times. I just don't know the answer. Or does it go out to the suburbs and, and places like that? Uh, I believe it's specifically Kansas City Mo and Kansas City, Kansas, because other uh, places like Overland Park and I think maybe Olathe uh, applied for this as well. And it was first KCK and then Kansas City, Missouri that were granted this. So uh, I believe it is just those two and not places like Overland Park and other suburbs. That That's a whole different topic, but I'm, that's really exciting to me. Like, um, I'm just curious if, if that will be something we can track if people are moving back into the city proper and out of the suburbs to take advantage of this in their homes and what they can do with it. And, you know, I have the typical speeds, you know, in suburban Des Moines that aren't great. But if I had the opportunity to move into the city in Des Moines and take advantage of yeah. Google Fiber, I'd do it. I would wonder if as, as businesses would be moving too. I mean... When it's available to them, yeah. That, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, it could be a huge economic development project. But back to sign, um, back to the competition itself. Um, did you have a feeling I think about half of the companies were local but not a lot of the prize winners were local um, did you get a good read on why that was uh, I did not I mean I know you know a limited amount of prizes were doled out basically two and then the the people's choice award uh, so I know that it was a heavily local field of finalists uh, although there were apparently five continents represented in the the pool of finalists but can't say for certain why uh, why the prize winners, other than maybe the ability to demonstrate their need to use that high speed, uh, you know, ended up winning. Right. Yeah, um, I think there were 19 finalists, and 10 of them uh, were from Kansas or Missouri. That was the first published list, but it looks like 16 finalists like actually showed up. Do you know what the difference was there? Uh, I think it was maybe just a matter of anticipated versus people who, you know, eventually got there. And I, I assume it was because of travel complications and such. Uh, but yeah, it, as of the day before the event, we were under the impression that 19 were going to attend and then everything in the immediate aftermath said 16. Uh, so I'm not sure where the uh, discrepancy was there, but uh, apparently a few that were expected to show were unable to do so. Interesting. I wonder if those were the international, you know, the five continent finalists yeah, yeah. coming from other continents. That... I heard at, at one point that someone was trying to secure a visa to, to make <laughs> it from Spain here to make their, their pitch. So uh, apparently there may have been some red tape to cut through there. I suppose that's permissible as a, a reason not to attend. <laughs> uh, thoughts on the Gigabit Challenge and kind of what Chris wrote about its importance locally? I just would hope that the, the, the prize money comes with a little writer on it that says you have to open up office in Kansas City or whatever. Because uh, it seems like the contest would be completely pointless if they didn't actually do anything with the prize money to implement the solution they pitched. And the fact that it's being, you know, built in KC, that I don't think I don't see how they could go anywhere else if right. they were, you know, pitching for this contest. So. Yeah, yeah, I, and and that's been something. And, and I asked Chris that when he wrote the post if he knew, and he did not think that there was a stipulation that they had to actually build it out in Kansas City. So you win the prize based on the idea, what you do with the money. I mean, I'm sure there's other. Like logistics behind how you actually utilize it, but um, going forward, I would certainly hope if they do the Gigabit Challenge again, that that, that is a stipulation because I want to see these ideas happen. Like, mm -hmm. I, like yeah. that was the whole point of the idea was to get people um, uh, utilizing uh, the infrastructure that Google's going to put in. But if they're not actually going to use it, right? What's the point? What's the point? There's but not much publicity then for. No. <laughs> yeah, no. um, did bring some nice like TechCrunch people like that covered it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it was a good rep for the the region that this mm -hmm. happened and and but but they will be getting that for with Google Fiber for ever I think as this this moves forward. Um, I want to kind of segue this conversation into something Marco that you wrote mm -hmm. about um, talking about uh, five challenges I think to the the local um, uh, tech scene I guess moving into 2012 and one of those was connectivity and. Right broadband and just kind of have you tee that up a little bit. Sure. Um, well, we wrote a story early in the year just kind of talking about five challenges that were fa was facing Iowa, not, not necessarily Des Moines. Um, and one of those that, that was brought up was the connectivity, the broadband connectivity in rural areas of, uh, of Iowa. Um, there's people who are saying that this is a big year for that, that they're, they're Connect Iowa is a new group that's kind of pushing for its expansion uh, through the rural areas. And they're starting to make some inroads with local councils, local you know, local officials, um, trying to get the word out saying that we need more broadband connectivity in, in certain areas of the state. Um, but there's been a pushback, and that's that's the interesting part. I think that's going to be um, very interesting to kind of see it play out this year, uh, because there's some you know independent phone companies are looking at, at this the same. Wait a minute, hold on. Um, there's going to be a divide because you're not giving it you know fast enough 
for the speed con connectivity speed is different for rural areas than it's going to be in urban areas as far as how it's being pushed. So it's going to be interesting to see the pushback and see how that evolves. And is Connect Iowa part of the Iowa Economic Development Authority? No. Like I feel like they were connected in some. Are they not? No, they're not. Okay. Okay. Outside any. Um, that's interesting. So I had that, that fact wrong. Um, but I know there are lots of lobbyist groups, like uh, Broadband for America, I think, is one that's, that's, that has talked to various people. And there are, I think, Heartland Development Alliance is involved in this. Um, so are they, the people that are trying to push it out, what's their kind of motivation in it? Like, why, why who's paying those lobbying bills, do we know? Like, well, that's, no. I mean, that, that's okay. the, I mean, one of the big things. I mean, it seems like any, any time you have a, you know, for and against thing, you, you don't look at the companies, you look at the lobbyists. So we'll see how they uh, how they stack up. Where's the money coming from? Yeah, yeah. And and the local telcos in various parts of the state don't want to have to implement this. Is I think it's a, I think it's a matter of, of uh, uh, you know the speeds that are being proposed are slower in rural areas than they would be in urban areas, okay. causing what they're saying is, would be a di digital divide. This is a, an interesting. <clears throat> um, conundrum, or I guess, or an interesting issue to look at, and we have not focused on this mm -hmm. at all at Silicon Prairie News, so I'm glad that, that, that you were writing about this, um, is how does the rural part of the state kind of keep up with the entrepreneurial efforts in, in the urban parts of the state? Um, I know that the, the Iowa Startup Fair this afternoon, like mm -hmm. it has four different cities, like they're really trying to get the whole state involved. We really focus on Des Moines mostly, and then do some other stories as well. Um, Michael, do you know from your experience, like are similar issues being faced in rural Kansas and rural Missouri? I would have to think so. Uh, given my previous coverage uh, or my, my time in rural Kansas, Missouri, I, I don't know, but uh, I think that's a safe assumption. Again, I, I covered kind of a different beat during my time in rural Missouri, so uh, I didn't pay as close of attention perhaps as I should have to this subject. Uh, no, and that's that's fair. I didn't didn't really prep you for that one, but I'm just <laughs> curious. I mean, I would have to think it's the same type of thing. I My in-laws farm in northeast Iowa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, northeast Iowa, and they have a um, there's no access to broadband to get to their farm. So they're not operating any sort of business that would require connectivity, but nor do they have the option to go into that. So. And, and I, think, I think one of the, uh, you know, one of the, the issues I think uh, the Connect Iowa uh, people are, are trying to, to promote is, is that, that fact. I mean, if, if there's someone in that house, in that farm, um, who did have an entrepreneurial uh, type of endeavor they wanted to do and they needed connectivity, they would have to move, or they would have to find a way, um, or maybe have to deal with much slower, you know, uh, uh, speeds of connectivity, and that that's got to be an issue. Yeah, I, I would think so. And the, I remember the president mentioned it in the State of the Union two years ago. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. When he talked about like rural connectivity in Iowa being, and it like specifically said Iowa a, as an issue. So maybe it is worse here than than some of the other states in the region. There's been, I mean, companies trying to solve that for a while now. I did as a in college, I did an internship at a startup that was doing wireless. Prairie Inet. Yes. Yep, I remember Prairie Inet. And uh, there's a lot of difficulties in getting that up and running, and that was even more rural towns, not more, not even touching on rural farming areas. We're talking small Iowa towns that we're trying to connect. Because, uh, yeah, weren't they trying to, like, put, like, line of sight connectivity, like, up on the, the yeah. courthouse tower They'd in go a to small town? And all the towns with co-ops in them, which was a popular target, put towers on top, and then they could, um, all the towers connected to each other, and then they'd spread out wireless internet across the town. But you still have the problem with farms and other rural, rural, rural areas that, you know, don't have a co-op next to them. And they, you know, there's a six mile line of sight issue with that. So, um, there's still a problem. I think there, um, in the last 10 years, there's been huge inroads in, do it, in solving that problem, but it's still there. Well, and I think there are local telcos maybe, or utility boards at least that have adopted this already and are providing, like we talked Brad Dwyer from Hatchlings. Um, he lives in on um, Lake Panorama and he has faster internet connection speeds in rural whatever county that is, a rural Dallas County, we'll say, than we do in the city of Des Moines, just because that local telco or utilities board has decided to, to put fiber in already. So that's a, it's a value add to their community that we don't even have here in the, you know, the city. Well, it's one of those things where, I mean, uh, you wonder how it's going to evolve, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take that kind of, uh, I think, cooperation, but we'll see if they can figure it out, figure out how to get it. Yeah. Um, oh, very interesting. I mean, I think this is an issue that we need to pay more closely to closer attention to. It's certainly one of your issues for the year. Um, it's not one that we see every day, so I'm excited to follow your, your coverage of that um, um, throughout 2012. Well, um, we're almost at the end of our time, so why don't we go ahead and talk about our other favorite new segment, yes. Andy's Stat of the Week. What is our Stat of the Week this week, Andy? $175 million is what? 
the company Meredith down the street paid for allrecipes.com last week. Uh, Marco here wrote the story here, broke the news for the Des Moines Register. Um, its addition will almost double digital revenue generated by the Meredith's Women's Network and more than double the network's audience to about 40 million monthly unique visitors, according to the company. Um, they bought allrecipes.com from the Reader's Digest Association, um, who bought the site in 2006 for 66 million. So that was a pretty good return on that. That is a really good return on your investment. And this is allrecipes.com. It's it's a is it just the domain or it's a whole business? It's the bought? whole whole business from okay. um, they have very popular iPad apps to um, I think in the story you said they had the top YouTube channel or one of the top yeah, YouTube they're... channels. Um, so it's this whole um, this whole network that they've built up over the last several years that they're acquiring. And they're on a roll. Yeah, <laughs> Meredith's on a roll. I mean, they made a couple couple buys last year and now this one uh, they say it's just a coincidence that they all lined up at the right time and it's a, it's interesting to see they're growing <laughs> I mean yeah. I didn't think they could grow anymore but they're 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 a behemoth right Michael your take on allrecipes.com uh, what strikes me and, and granted I'm not a uh, allrecipes.com connoisseur by any means but uh, similar in nature it seems like to Pinterest in that it's a lot of user generated content and you know recipes and kind of do-it-yourself type stuff. So uh, kind of ties to a, a another hot startup with with Des Moines connections, and it's interesting to see that people are really kind of seizing upon that niche of the market as uh, as one that's got a lot of potential. Yeah, and for sure, a similar customer base for Pinterest or user base mm -hmm. and all recipes. Um, uh, so yeah, that is that is not a connection that I made. That that is an interesting one, and I know that Meredith's very interested in Pinterest. Um, you know, talking with some of the Meredith team that came out to see Ben speak at Ben Silverman speak at Think Iowa, you know, a, a lot of the web traffic that goes to Mer like Better Homes and Gardens and those things online come from people pinning room designs they like and right. now recipes they like. It's going to be a perfect acquisition for them. And if, if Google doesn't try to eat them up first just to have them, um, just to get Ben back probably, yeah. I think <laughs> Meredith would be, I mean, investing back into a Des Moines entrepreneur, I think that's even... It's a good PR move, not that that would be why they'd buy it, but they can spin that too. Well, and hasn't Google already tried? I feel Did like it? I read a story on that, that they've, Pinterest has kind of already turned down Google a couple times, and in that they said they noted that Ben Silverman does not necessarily want to go back and work right. for Google. He's kind of uh, done that. Oh. And maybe we'll get him back here in Des Moines. That would be, that'd be awesome. He he's, seems like a, a great entrepreneur. We'd love to have him in the city. Um, well, that's all the time that we have today. So, Marco, thank you for joining us. Yeah, and for um, me. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun to have you on. We'd love to have you on again. Michael, you don't get a choice to come on. I can <laughs> just tell you when you're going to be on the show. So we appreciate your time um, and, and being the Kansas City guy for us today. Um, yeah. uh, thanks again to Delta Dental for their support of the show. Marco, where should people go to find out more about you and what you write online? Well, I mean, follow me at, at uh, Twitter at, at Marco Santana um, and also at DesMoinesRegister.com. Um, we have a technology page there now that, that we're blogging a little more and, and getting that uh, loaded up and, and looking forward to a good year. Perfect. Michael, how about you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at J as in James, Michael Stacy, uh, and then of course at SiliconPrairieNews.com. Andy? You met Andy.com. Find my personal blog at gwood.me. Prairiecast is produced by John Thompson of Evolve. Find out more on his services at dmevolve.com. For more on our show, you can check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash prairiecast. For all the news and culture related to startups on the Silicon Prairie, go to siliconprairienews.com. We will see you here next week.